uh, apologies in this show. Uh, there will be some audio problems. It does happen from time to time. We are fallible, although we don't like to admit it, and sometimes there are issues that only arise after we've finished recording. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 83, part 2, the Space Exploration Show for May 2019. And despite a barrage of sanity checking from listeners and a whole heap of told you so from Paul, we're not going to bow to the astronauts on moon by 2024 cynics or the moon-based naysayers. On this show we live by the words of Bob Geldof as we let in light and we banish shade. We're not going to let in practical timelines and political winds of change. No, 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 mate, we are. It's it's not going to happen. Let it go, Ralph. Just let it go. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, trying to spread a message of hope against the tide of negativity. And joining me is the man who tears every page out of dictionaries after the word fact, and whose aftershave is actually called Rationalism by Chanel. Paul. Hello. And the lady who breathes critical thinking and has a place in the Guinness Book of World Records for being able to spell the word empiricism, even when drunk, Jenny. Hello. So we've got a rather interesting uh, news section coming up with some really big hitters in there. And I think our listeners will probably guess what it is we're going to be talking about. Before we get to that, though, do we want to give a last chance mention to Pint of Science, Jen? Yes, I do want to give one final mention of Pint of Science, because if you're listening to this on the release date, um, then it is one week until Pint of Science begins, wherever you are in the UK, um, 44 different countries across the globe. Um, Pint of Science is happening the 20th, 21st, 22nd of May. I mean, of course, I want you to come to my event, which is in Cardiff, in Beelzebub's, um, where they're doors from 7pm, show starting at about 7.30. We've got two half an hour talks every night, activities every night. I'm doing the astronomy quiz on the Monday. So if you want to come and do that, come on the Monday. Uh, we've got all our prizes now. We've got some great swag from uh, the IOP. So the Ooh. Institute of Physics. So that's what I was hoping for. But yeah, so thank you, IOP. Um, we've got some books to give away, which I'm very excited about. Um, We've got the thermal camera and there is, a, there is a very strong chance that we are going to have a printer hooked up Ooh. to the camera. <laughs> that one actually does deserve a new because you're going to be able to take away your photos of you in the infrared. Ooh. Have you got a pregnant her as well? Uh, well, I don't know. Someone who's, you know, eight and a half months pregnant and listening to this, please come waddle up those stairs. Let's get you in front of the camera. <laughs> I can't say that, can I? It's true yeah, though. When so. you're eight and a half months pregnant, <laughs> yeah, they do. Want it's it. in the name of science. Yeah, please come. I want to see if it's true, and even and if it's not true, that's great too. I just, I need yeah. to find out. Is it true? Is it an urban legend? Is it an urban myth? Because can't find anything really on the internet. So uh, yeah, please come along if you've got a, a lovely baby in your belly. I want to see if I can see it with the infrared camera. That's 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 not weird at all. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> if you uh, want to buy tickets, um, because I have found out that we will be checking names on the door. Apparently, we're going to be given a list of people, so it's like a proper VIP event. Um, but if you do Ooh. want to buy tickets, uh, head to the Pint of Science website. Um, they're, they're on Eventbrite, so everything is safe. And presumably, you'll be there to chat to people and take free drinks off them if they want to offer you one, won't you? Oh yeah, a thousand percent. I like gin. Mm -hmm. Gin and tonic, not gin and lemonade. Pink gin mm -hmm. is good. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be there all three nights. So uh, if there is anyone listening and uh, they do want to come along and they just want to chat some science, that's great. That's fine by me. Probably better off doing that on the Tuesday or Wednesday because I'm going to be somewhat occupied with the, the music quiz, which, by the way, is brilliant. Mm -hmm. I am very proud of it. <laughs> it's going to be good. So for that people should head over to Eventbrite and look for the Pint of Science in Cardiff. Or just type Jenny Millard in. I think that, that gets it as well. But you've got a retraction from the last episode, Jen. Do you want to take us through <gasps> I that? I do. I do have a retraction. I made a big boo-boo. you got your power wrong. Things aren't as powerful as you thought. I made a boo-boo. 
I entirely blame Kevin and the gin that he was plying us with uh, <laughs> when we were recording at Astro Camp. That was very good gin, though. But we said that the stellar mass of M87 was uh, 10 to the 9 solar masses. It's not it's 10 to 11. 10 to the 11, even, solar masses. Because when we were recording the episode, we were like, whoa, the black hole weighs as much as the mass of the, the stars. Whole galaxy. <laughs> and we were like, whoa, that's insane. And it was insane because it's crap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the stellar mass is actually a hundred times greater than the mass of the black hole, which makes more sense. What's two orders of magnitude between friends? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not bad when it comes to space, right? Yeah, it's still still probably more accurate yeah. than Hubble's line on that graph. Oh, God, mm. <laughs> on that scatter plot, right? But uh, yeah, so I apologise for that. Uh, but yeah, stellar mass of M eighty seven is a hundred billion solar masses. And the mass of the black hole is 1 billion solar masses-ish. Mm. And it's not just that that caused us some problems last time, because uh, we got a lot of comments from all of you lot, really, on um, on our last space exploration show, where we quite clearly wandered too far from the shores of certainty into the deep waters of conjecture. Um, that's with our opinions on commercial versus government funding for space exploration and um, getting humans back to the moon by 2024. You really punished us for, for our <laughs> views on that. Um, our good friend Ralph Van Eindhoven says, do it properly as a long-term plan and not as a short-term propaganda gain for whoever needs it. Ronald Jackson told us, just listen to your 20-minute rant. You simply don't understand the current political social situation. Ben Harding in the UK put it very simply, you are so wrong. <laughs> what was, what we, we, we can take criticism. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't upset us. <laughs> it doesn't upset what, us. What were we wrong about? Um, I think people thought that, that probably me, uh, being a bit too optimistic, a bit too naive, a bit too, yeah, we can do this, it'll be fine, yeah, 2024 is not mental or anything. <laughs> so basically, mental. they're all hating on you. Uh, pretty much, yeah, because Paul's the cynic, <laughs> so he's basically taking the, 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 the conservative and the... Uh, the the, the, the faultless line because who's gonna who's gonna argue with a healthy dose of skepticism me true <laughs> and our good friend tom in maryland emailed us about my um belabored news story last month and uh, the one where i was talking about the knowledge repository left on the moon by israel's bereshit and america's arch mission foundation tom said the story you describe on the lunar repository reminded me of the classic story by arthur c clark which i didn't hear you mention I almost cried when I first read this story many years ago, and it points us to the short story of The Star that was first published in the science fiction magazine Infinity Science Fiction in 1955, where um, the, the basic premise is that a group of space explorers from Earth return from an expedition to a remote star where they discovered the remnants of an advanced civilization that were destroyed when its star went supernova. Has anybody read that? Yes. No, and I've not. Yes. I and hadn't, but it's a short story, and it was really worth the read. It, it's the Jesuit priest one, isn't it? It is, yes. yes. Who's who's the? I've read it long, long, long time ago. Um, the Jesuit yeah. priest, the astrophysicist, and he loses his faith because of yes, yes, yes. That is the one I was read. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Story. Oh, well done, not giving the spoiler at the end away there. That's. Uh... <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for pointing that one out, Tom. Um, it was uh, it was nice to have read that because I, uh, one of the things I really like about I think both Carl Sagan and um, Arthur C. Clarke were very good at this, and it's become a kind of trope now that that is really tired and hackneyed and not done very well. But that kind of science first religion thing that used to be done really well in the sixties mm. and seventies, but now it's really tired and and quite kind of lazy. But it's always in kind of sciencey science fiction things. But, uh, yeah, thanks for sending that over. Mm. Okay, that's enough whimsy. Now it's time for the news. And this is all kind of just fillers. It's kind of like the starter and the amuse-bouche for, uh, for the two big news stories that we're going to discuss because there are two big news ones this time. So so you guys who are giving news stories now and rattling through some of the, 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 the less interesting news stories, you've kind of wasted your time, but who wants to go with the, the first amuse-bouche? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. I quite like mine. I mean, you say that, oh, they're boring. <laughs> well, what I've done is I've tried to go for a completely different vein to what we're talking about in the main news stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so my first story, I'm diving straight into something out of your favourite sci-fi novel, Robot Assistant. Oh. Mm. 
Now, at the end of April, supplies were launched to the ISS via an Antares rocket from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. Say that when you've had six gins. <laughs> now, on board was some 3,500 kilograms of science gear, which included 40 mice to test the viability of administering vaccines in space, uh, some supplies to keep the crew alive, and two astro bees. Now, what on astro earth... Astro beans? Astro bees. As in bzzz. Yep. As in bzzz. Ooh. Flowers, honey, that sort of bee. Ooh. Now, what on earth, or in space, is an astro bee? I hear you cry. What is an astro bee? Mm. Yes, that's exactly what we want to know. Well, I kid you not, they are small robot companions to help the astronauts and cosmonauts on board the ISS complete routine tasks. They ha- are literally little robot helpers. Pollinating plants? No. And, well, I mean, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? If they mm. just went around, like, licking flowers. Felatio? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I hope not. There, there is a camera on board, so probably not. They're about the size of a loaf of bread. Uh, they're kind of cuboid in shape. Uh, and they're also completely free-flying. And they move about using little electric fans. Um, so kind of like an airboat, but in 3D, right? I, I know that's not the best analogy because there's no water on the space station, but it was the best that I could come up with, okay? Um, hmm. Now, these astro bees are kitted out with a bunch of sensors uh, which are made to detect carbon monoxide, radiation, things like that. They've also got a little extendable arm so they can grab hold of rails or objects and the robots will kind of happily pootle along on their own um, or they can be controlled with a remote control by the astronauts or by controllers and researchers back down on Earth, hence... None of Whoa. the fellatio stuff. I hope, anyway. <laughs> so it could be done in their sleep by oh. pesky ground controllers. Right, do you know what? I, I am stopping this conversation dead and I'm going <laughs> to carry on with the rest of the story <laughs> because we're headed down a very dangerous path. Anyway, the onboard camera on these astrobees is useful for examining any problems that the space station uh, might have remotely. Um, and also, they've pointed out, for keeping an eye on the crew. Oh, yeah, so yeah you can make of that what you will um, mm. Mm. the astro bees have been sent up uh, to transport experiments and help maintain the space station and just to see how robots and people can work together and I think that's amazing like actual robot helpers on the space station that can think for themselves move about by themselves do menial tasks yeah Ugh. This is there's a crossover here to a story we did last year. I think it was last year or earlier this year. What this is is it's a remote surveillance capability to check that people on board the space station aren't drilling little holes in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vladimir, what are you doing over there? Oh, nothing, nothing. Because he's French, <laughs> Vladimir. He's French, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Night talk <Nighthawk> calling. <laughs> now. Next story. I'm coming firmly back down to Earth and I'm dragging you two with me. You can start being sensible. Mm-hmm. We're going to head to sunny Portugal oh, and okay. we're going to congratulate them on launching their National Space Agency. Oh, everyone's doing oh, it Oh, I now. missed that one. Yeah, it's a good story, right? Yeah. And this new space agency is going to be based at Ponta Delgada, the capital city of the Azores, which is a chain of nine volcanic islands kind of to the west of Portugal. Um... They have views of building a spaceport and infrastructure for monitoring and tracking satellites there. And they're aiming to start launching small satellites in just two years' time. And they're also thinking about allowing companies like Virgin Galactic to use the spaceport for space tourism. They've got plans to build an environmentally sustainable rocket, which is actually a really interesting concept. And it's definitely a step in the right direction for kind of future-proofing space exploration. They're joining a really elite club because there are 70 countries uh, on the planet that have their own space agencies, which are supported by the government, but only 14 of those can actually build and launch rockets. Doesn't sound very exclusive, though, 14. I don't know. I think so. Mm, I don't. I've got nothing to back that up. Okay, they're joining an interesting club. (laughs) <laughs> is that better for you? Don't back down, Jen. Don't back down. No, stand your ground. It's easily. Easily. There's 14 countries in the entire globe that can build and launch their own rockets. There's probably about 14 countries that can build cars in the world. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's only that, 14. Surely. 
takes one asteroid and bam, we're down to like 12. <laughs> <laughs> so, getting back on track, why are they doing it in these zones? Well, it's a good location. Um, it's reasonably central between mainland Europe and America. Uh, the island of Santa Maria, which is one of the bigger islands, um, is home to one of ESA's tracking stations. So there's actually precedence for this kind of infrastructure being built on the island. Um, the population count is also reasonably low. And few people, few people means yep. little light pollution and also plenty of space for building stuff. Uh, now, Portugal yes. has had a space program since 2009 and it's been a member of ESA, that's the European Space Agency, since the year 2000. So they've got a long history of space exploration and this is just the next natural step. You mean 19 years? So, mm. It's not oh, that it's good. You know, they've been plodding along nicely. So congratulations, Portugal. Well done, you yeah, guys. That's cool. That's cool. Little known fact, but one of the um, abort landing sites for the space shuttle was on the Azores as well. Was it really? Hot damn. Did mm. not know that. Yeah. So if it all goes horribly wrong, you're going to aim for a little island in the ocean. Mm. Not a massive yes. bit of land with the dead on it. No, no. Let's pick the island. Because it's in the middle of a huge area where you couldn't land, but it's got a big off landing strip oh fair play <laughs> yeah the thing is when it went wrong it never made it that far yeah too soon too Ooh. soon yeah probably oh we're gonna get letters we are gonna get letters no not letters we've never had a single letter we're gonna get emails we are gonna get gonna emails. angry angry emails well, what does NASA <laughs> stand for no please don't <laughs> I'm not gonna say it the uh, <laughs> National Aeronautical and Space Administration, clearly. Exactly. <laughs> Paul, can you top Astro Bees and Portugal getting a space agency? Oh, OK. They are good stories. You're right, Jen. They, they are, are good stories. stories. OK, well, I'm going to go with a, Thank little, you. a round-up of some of the other stories you might have missed. OK, so Ariane Space is set to launch 42 satellites on a single Vega launch on the first of their small spacecraft mission services. Wow. Yeah, I know. 42 in one go. 42. Uh, 42. We are fully One booked. for every year you've been on this planet. I know, exactly. It's like a celebration. Uh, we are fully booked. We have no gram left of performance, said Marino Fragnito, who it sounds like a made-up name, frankly. Um, he's the vice president of the Vega Business Unit, um, Ariane Space. So a second SSMS is almost fully booked for next year, while the first mission is set to fly on the 5th of September. Cool. Does that not make anyone like a little bit nervous that they've pushed it right to the very edge? Because no. all they need, right, is like a couple of birds to shit on this rocket before it launches and they're <laughs> overweight. Well, I, I suppose <laughs> that that shows the confidence in the Ariane system, which I think we've mentioned yeah, before. Vega, is Vega, one of the... Vega's a great rocket. It has yet yeah. to balls up. So yeah. it's a good system. Uh, next, there's still no revised budget from NASA that will flesh out the uh, 2024 plans. Brian Stein had suggested he would get the figures to the people who matter on Capitol Hill by April the 15th. But in what is perhaps a portent of things to come, uh, Gersten Mayer, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations, had to apologise to the members of the House Science Subcommittee and promised that their homework would be in soon. Oh, that doesn't bode well, does it? It doesn't bode well at all, really, does oh, it? Uh, you don't even know how much it's going to cost. Um, <laughs> sticking with the US space politics, the Congressional Budget Office, a sort of tutting bank manager of the US government, has suggested that <laughs> everyone's favourite Robert Heinlein-inspired military arm, Space Force, will cost a lot more than the Department of Defence had so far suggested. In fact, by, an, <laughs> by an order of almost four annually. Um, wow. The original estimate being 500 million a year, CBO has put it at more like 1.9 billion. So close, they weren't far off. Is that an extra 1.9 billion over the No, rest no, of the they, they think it'll be 1.9 billion a year in in total. And yeah, but I mean, will that be money that they'll take from other armed Oh, yeah, yeah. Forces, it, it, or it, will it's, that be... This is extra budget that will either be required or we need wow. to be kind of hived off of the defence budget elsewhere. Ah. Yeah, so what, that, one or like the other. Scrapping the US Marine Corps or something. Yeah. So, something like that. Um, so, they come. Mm. Space Force. Um, Space, Space Force. Force. Next. Grim Gafford. India has been bigging up its Chandrayaan 2 mission, which will launch sometime between July the 9th and 16th from the Indian Space Research Organizations, the ISRO, launch facility in Sirahakad Koto 
off of India's southern coast. This is a lander and rover combo which are scheduled to touch down at the lunar south pole on or about the September the 6th, becoming the first craft ever to land in that region and making India the fourth nation to land on the moon, if uh-huh. it works. Mm. Mm. Not so easy as the Israelis found out recently. Mm. Now, um, and my last one is kind of, well, feeds into our biggie, but I thought I'd mention it because it's. I think the dust is all settling on this one, and we'll we can talk about it a bit more. So lastly, <laughs> Blue Moon. You saw me standing alone without a dream in my heart, just a massive moon lander developed by Blue Origin. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff Bezos stood in front of a big model of a moon lander called Blue Moon, which turns out he had been in development for the last three years with organisations such as MIT, Airbus, Surrey Satellites. So he's aiming for a. Oh my god. Sorry? I'm so excited. I know. I know. So he's <laughs> aiming for a first landing on the lunar south pole um, with a thing that size, probably to squash the Indian satellite that'll already be there. Um, <laughs> in 2024. Where have we heard that date before? <laughs> <laughs> um, early 2024. Yes, early 2024. <laughs> um, oh my god, I'm so excited. I know. Initially, <laughs> three and a half ton payload. Increasing to six and a half tons. Uh, it uses naval style davits to lower payloads to the surface. Uh, so, if you know how you lower a lifeboat or a landing ship or something into the water. Um, mm. And it'll have a gigabit connection to Earth. That's mental. Isn't it? I don't get that on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is going to have to be laser communication, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I don't Lasers. know. I don't no, they're going to like get a giant fibre optic. He's going to be phoning up uh, Branson and be like, mate. He might. He may, in the end, I need the one is, of your big fibre optics. He might be just blowing smoke up our asses because, frankly, Amazon Prime's been crap recently. Um, I will not hear a, a bad word said about Amazon Prime. I, I was going to say, I've not had any trouble with Amazon Prime. I, it's because you, know you live what? in the back ass middle we, of nowhere. We have reached the point where we can't even see the point of paying for Amazon Prime at the moment because it turns up late, it's days late, it doesn't come late, it's rubbish. Well, you know I suppose to be fair, late, you don't pay for it for the TV. Mm. Yeah, but you know if it turns up late, you can normally complain and get like three months of Prime for free. Yeah, there you like, go. Like straight away. It's like the default thing that they do. Um, there you are, life hack people. But you know what, they don't even offer the bloody Prime in the first place and half the things anyway now. What are you ordering? Because nearly everything I order is Amazon Prime. I only order from Amazon Prime Look, I mean, to free okay, delivery. They are niche fetishes. They are very <laughs> specialist built dildos. Um, is, is it Astro Bees? Well, exactly. Yeah, all that salation. Special fillating Astro exactly, Bees. Exactly, exactly. It, oh, to be fair, if I order stuff from Amazon, it is either Amazon Prime or I'm ordering something from China and I'm willing for it to take a month to arrive. Yeah. Man. Anyway, mm. what are you ordering from China that takes a month to arrive? Okay, I have this really weird hobby, right? I type really random shit into Amazon, right? And then I <laughs> and then I reorder it so that it's priced lowest to highest and you get like really random shit from uh, China, which actually turns out to be surprisingly useful sometimes. So like for like 50 Well, like just pot look on Amazon. Yeah, so like I I typed in like um kitchenware or something. I reordered it and I found these like little silicone spoon rests for when you're doing your cooking. And they were like 50p, and they're marvellous. And I found, like, these little <laughs> sucky things that you, like, put on the wall of your bathroom to, like, hold dishes. Paul buys little sucky things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so I, I just have this weird hobby where I just type random words into Amazon Prime and... You. Well, not Amazon Prime, just into Amazon, into the search, and I just see what cheap shit I can get from China. You really need to get out more. <laughs> 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 I re- no, what I need is more money so that I can go out. What I can afford is a 50p spoon rest from China. What I can't <laughs> afford is dinner. <laughs> so I pick my battles, okay? <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so good old good old Jeff Hugo Drax Bezos um, mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. dropped in that New Shepard will take suborbital passengers this year. Mm-hmm. So excited. New Glenn... Mm-hmm. His big rocket will go for its first launch in 2021. Yeah. Yes. And he wants to build massive natural parks and million people colonies in space. Boo. Yeah, can we ignore that bit, please? Because that's where it starts going mental. Yeah, that, that might be batshit crazy, <laughs> frankly. Can we partition Boo. that from science fiction 
and the here and now. I mean, we can, I think we can put the new Glen into the here and now because it's been in development well, for so many years and it's it's on the cusp of... I actually think that's probably the weak link if that doesn't get developed or, of course, if there's any failure with the lander itself, but that's been in development for three years and it's here as a concept, isn't it? But what, what do people think? Because, you know, you, you guys were... I think we were all had like excitement for the uh, the NASA plan of going to the moon by 2024 and even though I was advocating for it I don't think any of us really believed that in reality it's going to happen but that's because of NASA's administration and political cycles if you've got a company like Blue Origin that has its own launcher it has its own lander it's got the richest man in the world backing it does, do do you guys? Am, am, am I just going off on a on a crazy optimism thing again here, or do you guys actually think that this has got more chance of succeeding than NASA for twenty twenty four? This hundred percent has more chance of succeeding than NASA. Still not sure it'll be twenty twenty four, but I believe in this more than NASA. I uh, I don't want to be cynical because I say my my final comment is this: that really, this is it, this is really I think it's like the starting pistol on a massive pissing contest yeah. because we got and i'm happy for that to we've happen got, yeah. yeah it's space race 2 now we've got trump's moon plan we've got china yeah. stepping up its plans we've got india getting all ambitious elon going all bfr jeff now yeah. blue mooning <laughs> it's like space race 2 is official now this is this is this is kind of a thing that's happening it's a grudge fest as well yeah, exactly there is no love lost between trump and Jeff Bezos. No, no, exactly. So those two battling it out, you know, the the man who has, his, well, he doesn't have the purse strings, but the, the man who presides over the wealthiest country on earth and the richest man on earth in a grudge battle. Oh, and the richest man on earth happens to have been developing rockets and, and lunar landers for the last 10 years. Um, these two battling it out, this is starting to get delicious in a kind of not nationalistic space race, no, although no. you've got the Chinese on the periphery there as well. But you've got two two people in a grudge match wanting to get to the moon first in a in this pissing contest. My, but this is exactly what it was, right? Do you think it was? No, it was like this fifty years ago, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was but just it was Russia and America, than... yeah. and now it's president versus my entrepreneur. My guess is it's going to be within ten years. Yeah, I can get on board with that. I think yeah. it, uh, realistically, it's all it'll happen within ten years. It's going to happen because we've got enough people on board, like basically in the mix now, that are, are going to make this happen. Mm. But I think I think two thousand twenty four is just really, really optimistic. Yeah, it yeah. It, it does. It does make you realise yeah. though that the SLS and Orion are practically um, boondoggles. They are. They they. It was futile doing it because they couldn't have known at the time, but commercial um, solutions have just <laughs> gone. Were you going to say have just rocketed? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they have, haven't they? I mean, they, they have now shot far ahead of what yeah. governments can do. And now that they're further ahead in that um, uh, in that timeline, well, they- they're not going to be any slower. The, the issues will be, are they going to be any less risk of her, any more well, risk of her, this... that they're going to be safer. But I also think that commercial rockets and commercial landers failing have got more chance of, of surviving that than yeah. um, than, a, than a national programme, with pe- astronauts dying on a national programme, well, which this will feeds into, it a lot faster. This feeds into our big story, isn't it, about the whole idea that the, the SpaceX crew dragon explosion. Yes. The... Before we move on to that, have you seen... Just one last thing about Blue mm. Moon. Have you mm. seen yep. what Musk has been tweeting? No. No. Nope. But, but, so I'm Googling it fast. What, what's he been saying? <laughs> he edited uh, the Blue Moon logo. Uh-huh. And he got rid of Moon and wrote Balls instead. Blue Balls. Blue Balls. Shooting his load off all in one go. Was he, was he saying Jeff Bezos hasn't? Oh, I suppose it's a, it's a comment that he's now getting divorced, so what's he got blue balls? This could work in so many ways, couldn't it? Maybe. I don't know, but he he doesn't seem to be taking it very well, put it that way. Hmm. Nasty drink from the 80s. <laughs> that date stamps you. <laughs> uh, but then there's also that, that additional um, race there as well, that you've got 
to commercial companies wanting to be the first on to the moon. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you've got NASA wanting to be the first on the moon. You've got China wanting to be the first to return astronauts to the moon. This is this is just a fantastic yeah, pissing contest. The next decade is going to it potentially has uh, it's got it's got big sixty star space race written all over it. It's it's yeah. a great age for we nerds that missed out on Apollo. Yeah. Yeah, by the end of next decade, someone is going to have walked on the moon again. Yeah, and they're going to be taking 4K cameras. Yeah. How many years was it, really, from kind of start to end for Apollo? You know, all the tests with sort of Mercury and Gemini and all of those. Do you know what, it's interesting, John, if if you're you're really interested, follow Gavin, who's been on the show. Oh yeah, Gavin yeah, Price. Gavin's yeah, he been knows this doing loads out. of Apollo history recently on on Twitter. He's been doing some really yeah. good stuff. And there was a tweet. Mm. I can't. It might have even been today, where he pointed out he had a picture of uh, Armstrong, and he said, "You know what? It took oh yes ninety nine missions to get yeah. this man on the moon." And it was a list of all the the kind of programs and all the test launches and various things that NASA did to get to Apollo 11 and it didn't even include X15 and things like that and then once they'd done it they only did another six yeah yeah and you think there's like 99 missions that were basically all about getting to the the, the type of technological and skill level to be able to do that yeah which was incredible um, and but I mean the thing is a lot of that's already been done so this is this is now this is a different race. But yeah, yeah, this is what I'm wondering because mm. if it took 15 years last time, does that mean that we can do it in five now? No, well, I, generally you would say that because in the 60s life was cheaper in a kind of way. Uh, I, I know mm. I'm uh, I'm phrasing that really grotesquely, but you could take bigger risks in the 60s. And yeah. I've had this debate with Gavin as well. He He disagrees with me, but... Because things were um, kind of on a a Cold War footing, the, the race was just all out then. Whereas now, you look how long it's taken to develop the SLS, um, yeah. NASA's big uh, rocket uh, launcher, big heavy-duty launcher, compared to how long it took to develop the Saturn V. And it's taken so much, more, so much longer. Now, they're not putting as much money into it, but for heaven's sake... We developed uh, we the Americans developed the Saturn V in the nineteen late nineteen fifties early nineteen sixties. Humanity has already developed this rocket technology, and there's so much more technology this, that can go into it to make it safer and better, and should be be able to develop faster. But just the way things are done now, yeah. everything is so much slower unless you're a commercial company that's more agile. I say that that's the difference, isn't it? That you've got these commercial companies now that are not tied to NASA's. If you like political bases, that the reason NASA yeah. or oper- contracts, yeah. or tenders, exactly. or commercial. The reason NASA operates in certain states and has certain capabilities in certain places is is now very much tied to to the politics of, of, yeah. of space in America. That you know, SLS is being developed where it is and where it's being built where it is, and by certain companies because of the politics and various senators and representatives that are, have have that interest. Yeah, um, Texas, Louisiana. Yeah. Um and and California are you know they're the ones that are driving anything but forward because they've got employees in their states. People like Bezos and Musk have, have got haven't got to those ties. So they can go where they like. Yeah. And they and they'll they'll go to places where they that have advantages and and have tax advantages and have skill bases they can they can tap into and that they they're so much more agile and can develop these yeah. and so now it is literally about cost because all the tech is there. As proved, we did it in '69. So the tech to get to the moon is there. Yeah, and it's there. But also, space. companies yes, can then... move so much faster and, and be more agile in terms of all the subcomponents they need to bring on board. Whether it's new materials, whether it's hmm. um, um, memory foams or uh, or AI for the guidance systems, they can just go right. We're going to acquire this company, or we're going to. Um, um, we, we're going to license um, smaller companies that we need to make this bigger yeah. system. Well, NASA but, can't do that because it takes years to oh, go yeah. through tender processes. But, but, I mean, I mean, just look at taking taking Bezos, like Amazon. Think where we were ten years ago in terms of of online shopping and Amazon and logistics and things like. That. And look at where we are now, ten years later. Mm. Yeah, it's just the the changes. You 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 couldn't even imagine life without it for a start. Yeah. 
Well, it wasn't but, Amazon just a bookstore ten years ago? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it, did Amazon start out as a bookstore? It did. I think so. It just sold books, online bookshop. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, started as a bookstore in '94. When did he start paying tax? <laughs> next year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Always next year. Maniana. But it, 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 but it is incredible, isn't it? Just how far we've come in such a short period of time. Oh, yeah. Um, and a lot of that is technologies that we don't know are even coming around the corner. So, no. you know, mobile devices, um, um, high-speed uh, internet, 5G just around the corner. We just don't know what's going to enable you know, these gargantuan capabilities to come along that, you know, we can all buy into and, mm -hmm. you know, love them or loathe them. They enrich some people's worlds just exponentially. And, and mm -hmm. we've been saying about uh, Blue Origin regularly on this show that they have been the stalking horse mm. in all this. We've said this regularly, that they, they've been quietly working away in the background, working on the tech and not going after the massive contracts and, and mm. just doing it actually developing yeah and it, it it'd be really interesting to see how this pans out over the next next few years and this is where i think by revealing this lander that no one was expecting mm. that is further that ahead left field wasn't it wasn't it mm. um it, but it, so this, exciting this is this has been a real revelation i think and has really put Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin on the map has not just a kind of also ran kind of on the coattails of of SpaceX, but kind of whoa, oh yeah, these have just taken a well, huge kind of Gemini like leap. Do you know it was really yeah. interesting because it was it was it was just yesterday, wasn't it? And when this happened, as, yeah, and I as we're recording, I pointed out to you guys, and I'd only spotted it because I was I was putting the script together, my bit of the script, and I thought, oh, let's just have a look at news, and I literally thought. What are Blue Origin up to at the moment? <laughs> Literally, <laughs> the like. Oh, that's telepathic. It was bizarre. It was about twenty. You got a mind meld with Jeff Bezos. I'd, I'd been, <laughs> been like busy this week, not been paying attention to things. I thought, you know, what's Blue Origin up to? I haven't had a look at them for ages. See if they've got any kind of anything coming up or news. And literally, it was about twenty minutes before the announcement started, and it was just a few. Literally, not very many people on Twitter just going, oh. Jeff Bezos make a little announcement in an hour. I was like, oh, okay, what's he... And I sat and looked at it and watched it. I was like, bloody hell. And I, actually, I think I, I messaged you guys and just went, bloody hell. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, because you were messaging us and you were like, guys, guys, have you seen what Blue Origin is doing? And we were like, what? Because <laughs> hey. it was like half ten or something. And I'm just I'm sending you pictures of it going like, look at the lander, look at... The and then we lost our and couldn't get to sleep for hours but you know <laughs> fine <laughs> but well, yeah I anyway but in typical fashion unlike elon musk who shouts about everything quite rightly so i'm not doing him down for mm. that the, the the glitz and the pr is um is really important um to to getting things going and getting the investment in but in typical bezos fashion perhaps because he can fund things himself i don't know um he uh th i was looking around for a for a video conference or, or for more details on this and all it. there was is people that were reporting yeah. from his very low profile kind of chat to i think it was school children and, I, and aerospace people there were lots of people very cross about this and lots of people sending really snotty tweets to him saying like why haven't you live streamed this why and you know what? i thought yeah do you know what this is his style yeah it's completely yeah. his style musk is all about the brashness and all about sort of you know yeah. me 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 look at me look at me actually Jeff Bezos, one of those people that you know, Amazon, one of the biggest you know, biggest companies in the world. How yeah. many people actually know or heard of Jeff Bezos? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who use yeah. Amazon? They don't even know who the guy is. Whereas everyone's heard of Elon Musk. Yeah, mm. and it's yeah. really interesting. It's, it's just that's his style. He, it, yeah, it's a, it's a different way of doing it. No one could ever accuse Jeff Bezos of being all talk, no trousers. He is literally the guy that he, when he's got something, he puts it out there, mm. and until mm. then. You don't hear anything from him. No, exactly. Um, and and you know, that's been really interesting recently, actually, is watching um, the Musk versus Bezos sort of fans that you see on Twitter. It's bizarre, isn't it? There is these sort of camps that have appeared. That's so and, tribal. It's oh, It's got to be something primeval in humans. Uh, it is, it is. And the Musk ones, they, 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 they're quite a big group. Yeah. And they, they've got a lot of opinion. 
<laughs> and they they like their man, don't they? They really like their man. It is quite quite odd. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess it. I guess it's the equivalent of kind of. Um, Red Sox versus Yankees or um, or yeah. Arsenal versus Man United. It's kind of, you can't just enjoy the football or enjoy the baseball. Mm. You've got to have a, a tribal team that you follow. Mm. But m- my view in all of this is, I, I want all of these to succeed. I, I oh, yeah. don't back a horse in this. I, I might have an opinion on who I think will get there first, and that will change uh, quite frequently. Mm. But this is all good. I, I, I am not being tribal in this at all. And, and oh, uh, no, no. as I mentioned last time, you know, even Trump, who I absolutely detest, if he's saying he's going to try and force America onto the moon by 2024, by whatever means, oh no, I will back him to the hilt on that, and I can't stand the man. But mm. I don't care. I just want to get people to be a spacefaring mm. nation again and start and, exploring and, new worlds. And on that, it was actually what our big story is about, was SpaceX. The, the, the SpaceX. Yeah. Well, actually, the big story was uh, Blue Blue Moon, Moon. but you stole the thunder on that one. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, so yeah. Let's. So SpaceX. Yes, they they have actually. They've had a setback in the same uh, same month Mm -hmm. that uh, that Blue Origin have uh, Mm. have stormed ahead. Yeah. I mean, this is. I mean, they 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 had an announcement the other day, a little press conference saying um, a little bit more information on it, but actually, not much more information. There's no real meat on the story yet about sort of what happened. Uh, and if you've completely missed this, if you've been living in a cave, basically the Dragon X, the, the, the SpaceX Dragon capsule that was launched the ISS a few weeks back, been there, come back, uh, and was going to be used on the abort test coming up. That was kind of like the final box check before astronauts went up on uh, the Dragon capsule. Blew up. Mm. <laughs> really spectacularly. Yeah. The video is incredible. Um, yeah. It really goes bang. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that went boom was the uh, escape engines, the Super Draco escape engines, right? Yeah. Which which are there to kind of get astronauts out of the way if something happens during launch. Yeah, that's the the fail safe backup, isn't it? Yeah, and it went boom. So no no one was hurt. It's important to highlight that no one was hurt in this. But the capsule was damaged. But the good news is that this is done on the ground with no humans around. It's not an Apollo 1. It's not an Apollo 13. No. This is something that they've yeah. identified before. It can be of any harm to anybody, but it's bound to create setbacks, isn't it? Because the, it, the pace yeah. of development um, that SpaceX are going for is just phenomenal. So anything like this has to have a negative effect on yeah. moving the timeline yeah. further to the, to the and- right. It's an interesting one because there's been various debates on Twitter and, and we've been sort of involved in this and, and about essentially there was this, this this slightly, I think, sort of cringeworthy kind of comment that this is not a failure. Well, it is. <laughs> yeah, that there's no such thing as essentially the, the, the argument is like, no, this is good data and this is good information. So it's not a failure. It was a test. And so what? It failed. And, and we no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I guess the question taking this forward is: obviously, the time schedule is going to slip to the right, but are they going to be able to make sure? Will this be serendipitous in the long run and make sure that it is safer? Because it's not just those systems. Going back to your point, Paul, it's not just the ones that they've discovered that um, um, that they need to fix, which they clearly do need to yeah. fix. But also, have they rushed everything else? Are there going to be other unknown things in there that? This is- uh, that is, could yeah, fail exactly and, it, and the thing is this has been a problem for boeing as well it's a problem for both and i i i actually think it's a it's a it's a problem of lack of it, it's probably the lack of because this is being done as cheaply as possible because hmm. it was all you know it's all about as, as ever the lowest bidder and all although those. everything gets everything has to be approved and assured oh, by of nasa course it is, but it's still it, it's it's it just has this feeling that you know they're trying to do this as cheaply as possible. Yeah. Well, they and will course, do, yeah, as commercial this companies, is, yeah. This is the downside of commercial companies in this this respect. Yeah, is that they, you know they're bidding, they're trying to make profit. This is this is not they're not doing this just for you know shits and giggles. This is this is business, mm. and you do start to have you know Boeing can't get the capsule right. They've had parachute issues. Mm. Now we've had SpaceX with these spectacular kind of failures. 
at, such, at a stage when they basically had said they're ready. I think that's that's what gets my goat with with the SpaceX thing. I mean, we're, we're, it's conjecture and all the rest of it, but yeah. you know, they had basically said Dragon's ready. Mm. They sent it to the ISS. They attached the thing to the ISS. They allowed astronauts on board. They brought it back. Now, yes, that that capsule's then been through a whole violent process of launch and landing and all the rest of it. So, yeah, but the whole idea is for everything to be reusable. Well, indeed, and and it should stand up to this sort of state. And I mean, with the parachute test, Gersten Mayer, him again, we mentioned <laughs> earlier, he emphasised that such failures are part of the overall testing process that will improve the ultimate design of the parachute system. Agreed. I don't see this as a negative. This is why we test. This is why we want to push things, he said. This is a gift to us. We've gotten data that is unique that will help us design and understand if this is something that needs to be fixed or it's something that was a nuance of the test. Do you think when that went poof that Elon Musk went, oh, this is a gift? <laughs> there is an element to that. I get, I get a little bit of that thread of, okay, you know, a test fails, that's why it's a test. This is a capsule that was essentially supposed to be ready. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit late in the game to be failing, isn't it? They fired that thing at the ISS. On the ground, they had the two astronauts, the two test pilots, who were going to fly the next capsule on the ground watching it, going, yeah, we're, we're taking this up in a few months' time. This Is, is us. their we're confidence going... increased or decreased? Yes. Mm, is exactly. this a gift to them, or are they now it just a little bit more <laughs> and and absolutely the people who say well the capsule will be safer when it finally does fly yes you're right you you're not wrong clearly it's gonna be a better design and a better capsule but i think my my kind of issue is this is ready this thing was was essentially being declared kind of operational the next flight was gonna have people on it wasn't it yeah this year in a few months time and it was gonna be and it's not and so this is this is pushed it well into the future yeah. and that I means they're going to now have to go through tested and assurance which has already been done to show that other systems work because they will have no confidence because these will already been tested and assured and every process will have been overseen by nasa already and they will have yeah. signed this off saying yep these are fine everything's good to go so that undermines your your whole confidence in the assurance process I say all these tests have now essentially got to be done again yeah, on every subsystem, any every yeah. critical subsystem. Yeah, so which is pretty much everything in a sp in space. Exactly, flight. <laughs> and I think we are a long way from commercial crew flight now. We're sort of at the point now where any corners and any budgets that may have been cut five years ago, that sort of stuff is now coming to light at this yeah. late stage. In a mm -hmm. big way. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know what I'm? I'm gonna go with is like Blue Origin have been the sort of stalking horse in in the kind of launching capability and everything, and and they picked up that DoD contract, didn't they, last year when out of the blue, because clearly the DoD they got sick of putting money into SpaceX. Yeah. What's the DoD? Uh, Department for Defense. They they went. Do you know what? Launch capability, future. We're going to give money to Blue Origin. They saw something in in that they're what they're doing and the tech they're bringing to it, and that they don't. We like that. That there's something going on there. SNC, Sierra Nevada Corporation. No, don't say it. What the little shuttle? Are you going to say that's the next stalking horse? I'm I'm putting my 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 <laughs> my mental invisible money. You're putting your Sidonian groat on that. On. <laughs> I'm putting it on Dream Chaser. No. What's Dream Chaser? No one wants low Earth orbit. Oh, Jen, come on, keep up. This Dream is a Chaser. little. This is a little futuristic tiny shuttle. But no yeah. one cares about low Earth orbit anymore. No, no. But this is for the space station. It's to go to the space station. So you think that that one will take over from Cygnus or from um, uh, I... Dragon as their supply vessel for their space station? I, just because it's been quietly, it was it lost the competition to SpaceX and Boeing. It's been doing test flights. Is they've been building it quietly in the background, doing doing the work, building it up. It's been all the tests been successful. It's they're lining it up for for its missions. There's various other countries have got involved and they kind of want to buy time on it and things like that. And it would not surprise me if we have all these problems with these capsules. 
bloody capsules. It's 2019. Okay, and here's going to be an aeroplane. It doesn't have to parachute. You don't have to worry about parachute failures. It has to worry about thermal tiles, though, which have proven to be a bit of a problem in yeah, the past. You know, I, I can see this as it, it will be the, the one that comes along, basically eventually steals a march and everybody else because it's just better. Too expensive per shuttle. The Cygnus capsules, you lose one of those, it doesn't matter. You lose a you lose a Dream Chaser, and it costs, what, five, ten times as much? I'm plugging figures out of the air, it could be a hundred <laughs> times as much, I don't know. Um, whereas a Dragon capsule, they don't really care as long as it gets there. <laughs> well... The, the uncrewed supply version, I mean. They, as long as it gets to the space station, so they don't far, really care. NASA has already paid for six uh, missions to the space station with Dream Chaser. Get out of town. Really? Mm. When are they starting? 2021. And that'll do that for three years, and then they'll deorbit the uh, the ISS. Yeah, then the ISS will come down. But, yeah. And not before time two. <laughs> and the whole thing's pointless. Everything. <laughs> Okay, so in the debate section for this month, all I'm going to do is just give you a quick reminder of what we're going to start next month. So you'll remember a couple of months ago, Paul was asking for what you think is the best space mission of all time. So the, that's space missions that have run in the past, not ones that you would like to happen. We've done that in the past. Um, and we're going to advocate on your behalf for the ones that you tell us you think are the best space missions, either um, human space missions or robotic missions. So the ones that are definitely going to be going through already because we've had so many um, people advocating for these are the Voyagers, Cassini Huygens, Apollo 8, Apollo 11, Hubble, and um, the ones that are still being contested because there aren't enough people advocating for them to, uh, to guarantee that they're going to go through are Mercury Redstone, Kepler, New Horizons, Pioneers, Chandra, Curiosity and Opportunity, Hayabusa, ISS, uh, STS-1, Viking and Vostok. But you can still influence those. So the Voyagers, the Cassinis, Apollos, um, Hubbles, Keplers are definitely going through. That We will be advocating on their behalf. So that leaves us another spot for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two more can make the cut to be advocated for out of all those others that I mentioned or any new ones if they come in in enough numbers. So... You've got probably about another two weeks to get um, to get your answers into us, um, and at that point we will then narrow that down into a top ten that we will then begin advocating for uh, in debates every month until we get to the best space mission, which we'll put to you to decide. So send us your emails to the show at awesomeastronomy.com what you think is the best historic space mission. Ignore those that are already going through because they're already going through regardless. And let's see what we get. We'll start next month. Only only six man manned. This is me. Only six human flights compared to ten robotic. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Okay, so following on from the 49th International Earth Day late last month and the grip of environmental protests around your globe at the moment, I'd like to take a look at a question from our good friend Mark Bentley of No Declared Location, where Mark says, Greetings, Princess Jenny and the Martian Wookiee brothers. You, got, you definitely got the best end of the stick with that one, Jem. Of course I did. Um, Princess then, Jen. As, can, we, can, we just, can we just have a moment for Chewbacca? A Wookiee moment. Oh, of course, oh. yes. Chewbacca's dead. Yeah. I know. <sighs> Too soon. Seven foot two he was. Was wow. he actually? That's amazing. <laughs> no. Get out of my way, you walking carpet. She's such a racist. <laughs> Um, Mark continues with lots of nice compliments that we won't bother you with here, but we've uh, taken them to our hearts and we use them as a surrogate for still having no podcast awards, just saying. Um, as we all know, getting to Mars is only part of the problem, says Mark. Getting there, I mean, it's not a problem for you guys. You no, do it. No. Well, no, no, clearly. Yeah. clearly. No, we actually do lay a few traps on the way. 
Well, and the problem is we're then going to have this old immigrant problem, aren't we? Well, yeah, we don't want that. And then you've got to go through all that Brexit stuff. You've got to go through building walls. and No, we don't want any of that. No, we don't want any of that. Yeah. Um, living there, as the overlords Wookiees well know, is fraught with danger and hazards due to not having a protective magnetic field like on Earth. Could a device that produced a field be placed at the L1 Lagrange point between the Sun and Mars to stop or dramatically reduce the crap that the big yellow monster is sending to Mars? Uh, if this <laughs> did work, uh, would the result help to thicken the atmosphere, thus helping the creation of useful resources, i.e. CO2, H2O? This led me to think about Earth and our major problem with global warming, which obviously we need to be focused on stopping this happening, but it seems like we've passed the point of no return. Could a device be placed at our L1 Lagrange point accurately tweak the amount of light that is reaching us to counteract the warming effect? Anyway, thanks for reading. I hope you can give an intelligent explanation of why my ideas are such random raccoon vomit. That <laughs> makes me think That's... that Mark might be in the US. Um, well, <laughs> intelligent might be pushing it a bit, but we can certainly give you our thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at that. <laughs> Greatest regards, Marky Sharky. Thanks, Marky Sharky. Okay, so uh, I want to concentrate on the last point about lowering the um, energy Earth gets from the sun to reduce the effects of global warming. But the Mars analogue is very similar, but much harder and slower to transform because Mars has no useful magnetic field or atmosphere either. Uh, I disagree. No atmosphere worth talking about. Well, okay, Hang okay, on. I'll give yeah. you a chance on that, Jen. I'll give yeah, you the chance. I've been, I've been googling the out of this because it's a really interesting question <laughs> have you been watching total recall and you think oh this terraforming stuff it's no bother yeah no 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 i've got an answer about the mars thing it's great oh well, we'll come to that in a moment then right okay so we'll come back to mars in a moment but if we concentrate on the solar shield for earth first who yeah. wants to kick us off i guess this is going to be paul <laughs> with explaining the air wall and garage point and what a space sunshade is before we look into whether it's feasible right well i'm, I'm going to go lagrange point so uh, this is um, a point in space where the combined gravitational forces of two large bodies equal out the, the, the centrifugal force felt by a much smaller third body. Um, so it's a point of equilibrium that's achieved with various forces. And this means you can park a spacecraft. So you find, find this point in space and you actually basically put a spacecraft there and it, it won't move from that spot relative to the bodies. So you don't need to keep supplying fuel to, to keep it in, its, no, in, in exactly. place. No, Exactly, you sort yeah. of park it up there. Um, so it's really useful. So there's things, you know, if you want something stationary relative to, to Earth, so space telescopes, so things like Herschel and things will put in these these points. Mm. Um, JWST is going to be putting one of these points. That, that, that That's they're useful. There's actually five points around a large body. So for Earth, L1 is between the Earth and the Sun, about a million miles away. Okay, so if you go towards the Sun, a million miles, that's where L1 is. Um, and that's what Mark Sharkey is talking about L1 in the direction of the sun. L2 is a million miles behind the Earth. So imagine the sun and the Earth lined up, making an eclipse go a million miles back, and that's where L2 is. Um, L3 is the other side of the sun. So if you imagine the, the Earth and the sun, then uh, the other side is L3. L4 and 5... Uh, L3, by the way, has never been used. We've used L1 and L2. They, they've had spacecraft or have spacecraft in them. We've never used L3. Ooh, no one... is that true, though? Maybe there's a planet there? Shut up. <laughs> Get out. Um, you you're on the wrong podcast, Jen. You drink uh, wine. Don't let the <laughs> woo door slam you in the arse on the way out. <laughs> right. Um, L4 and 5, these are the kind of the odd ones. Um, they're at 60 degree angle. So if you imagine Earth's orbit, these are in Earth's orbit, each side, in front and behind. And it's just like a 60 degree angle. If you draw a line from the Earth to the Sun and then do 60 degrees to the left and right, they point at the L4 and L5 points and they form an equilateral triangle with the Sun, the Earth and these, these Lagrange points. Um, those two are the most stable. So L4 and L5 are, are the really easy ones to use. It's where the um, Trojan asteroids of yes Jupiter exactly live. so things naturally kind of congregate in those those zones because it, it is they are very very stable points l1 to 3 are actually inherently unstable and they're actually much more difficult to use ah, um, that might and, be interesting for later yeah discussions. and so things like uh, the, the the it 
it actually does sometimes take a little bit of fuel to keep something in that position because any little bit of momentum in any direction can actually make it spiral in. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Jenny added to the script, L2 is where they they place a lot of telescopes like Herschel and Planck, um, but it is actually not perfectly stable. No, normally what they do is they set them on a little orbit around the point. To Exactly. So they have like a little bit of fuel on board. So they will stay there, but they kind of need to keep making minor corrections. Yeah. And that's whereas L4 and L5 actually are very, very stable points. And if you park a spaceship there, they should stay there. I rarely let you get away without a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Which we love you for. Exactly. You must know that they're named after the 18th century mathematician Joseph Louis Lagrange, Obviously. who first wrote about them in 1772. Oh. Um, in a thing that he named the three-body problem, which you may well have kind of come across that phrase in, in sort of gravitational things. Um, and as for a sunshade, well, that kind of explains itself. Yeah, people have been thinking about it. So the two um, the two most common things in sort of counteracting global warming are we either put literally some stuff in the way so that it kind of acts like sunspots on the surface of the sun and something that kind of physically blocks out some light. Or we put a big-ass lens up there, which will kind of deflect some of the light away. Those are the two uh, most popular things to do. Um, In an ideal situation, you put a a great big, massive lump of something up there. Um, Practically not feasible, because how on earth are you going to launch it? Um, because the size of the thing that you would need is Flipping immense. Huge. Absolutely immense. So in order to combat kind of the amount of global warming that we're seeing since the industrial rev- the well, the kind of industrial revolution that happened in the eighteen hundreds, uh, we need to block out two percent of the light from the sun. And of course, over billions of years, um, as the output the energy output of the sun increases, this fraction will need to increase. But anyway, we'll work on the two percent number. Um the area that you would need to cover at L1 um, amounts to 4.5 million square kilometres, which is <laughs> half the surface area of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now, there, there has been some research into this and someone suggested, it's all right, what we'll do is we'll take that 4.5 million square kilometres right, and we'll just chop it up into tiny blocks put those up like tiny little discs right they can kind of fly about act like those little sunspots that's how we'll do it right someone figured out that if you had uh, circles that were 30 centimeters in radius right you'd only need 16 trillion of them <laughs> that's all 16 trillion of them <laughs> that would be um, it however slight caveat is that if you did have 16 trillion discs, if you assume that they each weighed one gram, right, that's with all the electronics and everything on board, they weighed a gram, that's still 20 million metric tons. <laughs> Which would, in today's, well, I'm not even saying today's launch capabilities, sort of um, when, when SpaceX, Blue Origins, whoever, gets down to something reasonable, like a thousand pounds for a kilo or something it's still going to cost billions to launch this well, and then like paul was saying because l1 is unstable you've then got to maintain the orbits of mm. these 16 trillion discs some of which are inevitably going to get lost so you've got to keep replacing them and so it's going to cost billions every year to maintain this so although it's theoretically possible i'm not sure it's really practical <laughs> um and then yeah. the large lens, again, theoretically possible, but how do you get something like that up there? People have also talked about maybe having diffraction gratings up there to kind of diffuse the light. But again, it's getting things up there. So although in theory, I think that the little 16 trillion little disks are the best idea, not really practical. The thing with Mars is completely different because that's all to do with magnetic fields. Uh, so basically, Mars's problem is it doesn't have a magnetic field, which means that it is um, completely exposed to all the um, solar wind, all these particles which are constantly streaming off the surface of the sun. And 
the solar wind, if you don't have any protection, will literally rip away the atoms in your atmosphere. And that's exactly what's happened to Mars. We're okay because we've got massive magnetic fields and that's why we've got such a lovely atmosphere and why life thrives on this planet. You speak for yourself. We quite like it out here. Mm. You and your bunkers underground, I'm sure you adore it. There's nothing like a big Sidonian concrete bunker. The atmosphere is fantastic. It's just (laughs) very different to yours. I mean, each each to their own right. I'll keep my Earth atmosphere. You keep your stinky, farty Mars atmosphere. The methane chamber. Mm. Anyway, so in order to kind of terraform Mars, uh, what you need to do is sort of recreate that magnetic field um, so that Mars is then protected and an atmosphere can kind of rebuild itself. So what you would need is... Some research has been done and they think that you would need a magnetic field of about one or two Teslas. Now, what is what is one or two Teslas? That doesn't mean anything. MRI scanners, um, they are between sort of half and three Teslas. So that gives you an idea um, of the sort of strength of the magnetic field that we're talking about. Um, You'd place that at the L1 point of Mars. So just like Earth has got those five Lagrangian points, so does Mars. You place that at L1. And then the, that magnetic field would be enough to deflect the solar wind. Then what you'd have happening is um, once the solar wind is no longer um, kind of attacking the little atmosphere that remains on Mars, this will cause a rise in the temperature of about four degrees. That would be enough then to melt the carbon dioxide, which is in the form of ice, that four degree temperature uh, rise. Then, once you've got all this carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere, we know that carbon dioxide is an um, an immense greenhouse gas, so then you're going to have this huge global warming effect. Um, and then, hopefully, that would raise the temperatures enough to w- melt the water that is in, currently locked up in the polar ice caps on Mars. And they estimate that this would return the oceans on Mars to one-seventh of what they probably once were because a lot of the materials obviously have been ripped away by the solar wind slowly over time. Um, but yeah, and uh, that's that's the idea. But the biggest problem is maintaining this magnetic field and the cost of generating it. Now, an MRI scan, I think, costs, in terms of electricity and stuff, a few hundred pounds to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know... Not not horrendous, but if this is all the way at Mars and something goes wrong, that's a problem. Also, MRI scanners don't run for very long. Um, they only run for, like, <laughs> maximum of an hour at a time. So, like, can we maintain a magnetic field um, of, you know, like, one Tesla over decades and centuries? Because that's how long we would need for for this to work. Yeah, it takes so long for this to happen, yeah. and as we as we see on Earth, the balance is so critical. I mean, when it when you're yeah. talking about climate change, you know, a couple of degrees here or there makes a difference between whether you're in an ice age or whether you're going towards a runaway greenhouse effect uh, and end up like Venus. You know, you've got to get that critical balance right. Yeah, and you're talking about terraforming a planet in a way that. You've got all you're going to do is start warming it up and pumping a load of CO two into an atmosphere and 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 water vapor. You've got no way of controlling that. If you then start releasing too much, how do you rein that back in? Yeah, and then even with an atmosphere of water vapor and CO two, that's still not livable. You've then got to you know convince some plants to grow to try and get some oxygen on mm-hmm. there. You know yep. it would ultimately in order to get mars actually habitable it would take thousands or tens of thousands of years yeah and you might even then come across that ethical consideration of you might kill those microbes you you, you start finding that are native um martian microbes from billions of years ago when mars was habitable yeah because you could you, you don't know what you're going to wake up once you start warming things back up and uh, and there might be microbes under the surface that you find don't want any oxygen there because oxygen is phenomenally toxic how humans evolved to breathe oxygen that is so (laughs) toxic and carcinogenic is just bizarre yeah it's pretty corrosive stuff yeah i didn't know this 
Yeah, well, that's that's why you age because of because of oxygenation and. Uh, oh, so people who put themselves in these oxygen tanks to stay young are actually batshit crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, it's counterproductive. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and think of the money you can make from them. <laughs> uh, it, it's also rather damn flammable too. <laughs> yes, yeah. that is true. Mm-hmm. But yes, so I guess in summary, the greenhouse effect protection or counteraction for Earth, uh, technically, theoretically possible, practically, big red cross, uh, terraforming Mars um, by protecting it from the solar wind. Again, there are some ideas, but honestly, it's not practical in any sense of the nature. Perfect summation. Nice. Hmm. Well, there's probably better ideas like seeding the atmosphere with something that would absorb it higher up than the clouds or, you know, there's lots of like geoengineering ideas. Everybody just stop using the frigging carbon. Well, there is that. Um, I think now what was it? There was a stat I heard just about a week ago that really floored me, um, both in the UK and America about the amount of renewables, I think think that that we now in the uk is it half of energy is produced by renewables now we had our first day ever our first, first... 24 hours of not relying on coal wow. no ever. first week no a whole week was wow. it a whole week the whole week last week the whole of last week um the uk produced no electricity using coal which is marvelous yeah uh, I, I think America has, has really um, uh, supercharged what they're doing with renewables as well, although that's m- much more of a political issue there. So, you know, we're not going to get into that because it depends on what administration you've got and what lobbyists you've got in, in America. But in in the UK, it's it's good to see that regardless of the, the lobby groups that are against it, that there are huge advances happening as the price of renewable energy comes down. And... Uh, and like you say, Paul, dumping less carbon in the atmosphere. Yeah, you know, there's there's no point in doing these geoengineering projects unless no, you yeah, stop putting more carbon in the no. atmosphere. Yeah, no, it yeah. it's like trying to rebuild your house while it's still on fire. <laughs> yeah, put the fire out first. <laughs> put, put the fire out first. Then then we can look at trying to reversing the damage. Don't try and repair the damage while you're still damaging the damn thing. <laughs> Well, that's just about all for this month. While we've been concerning ourselves with ridiculously extravagant plans to save you from global warming, you Earthlings have already dumped 800,000 tonnes of CO2 into your atmosphere. That's 4.3 million tonnes over the course of this whole episode. You have been busy little bastards, haven't you? Yeah, you I imagine you weren't even aware. And so it is that like frogs in a pot, the fact is your planet's getting warmer, and that greenhouse effect that became such a dirty word a decade ago will likely become a runaway effect that can't be reversed if unchecked in the next couple of decades. Bad news for you, great news for us. We watched primitive life die out on Venus to climate change. Now we get to watch intelligent life get extinguished as Earth's climate changes. But more important than your inevitable demise... Till the 20th of May, we're still accepting entries for your favourite space exploration mission for the last 62 years. No Apollo 8, 11, Cassini, Voyager, Hubble, or Kepler, please. We've had lots of those. Do something different. They've already made the cut, so there you go. Pop it in an email to the show at awesomeastronomy.com with a couple of bullet points stating why you think it's the best, most exciting, or most important mission of all time. And we'll begin advocacy next month. And while you're choking on um, CO2... Um, and oxygen, apparently. Uh, yeah, and all those free radicals are floating around. Until next time, it's goodbye from Side Only Base. Bye-bye now. Bye. <laughs> awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod 
or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>